I'm Josh Gasser. And I'm Jordan Taylor. Welcome back to A Shot of Whiskey, Season 2, Episode 12. Let's get to it. We got a, a very, very special guest, March's own rock star, own superstar today, uh, the one and only Mike DeCourcy to talk a little bracketology with us. But before we do that, I'm proud to tell you that Underdog Fantasy has been rocking with us all year. On top of that, even better, they've been currently running a promo for all new users and the easiest way for you to get in on this special is by downloading their app and using our code ASOW24. If you haven't registered but and haven't deposited, you can still use the promo. So stop playing around. Go do that and start playing along on Underdog Fantasy with all of, with all of us. As we mentioned, the one and only Mike DeCourcy. Mike, appreciate you joining us today. Happy to do it. Absolutely. Love, love. You know, you are a, a Big Ten staple, a Fox, a Fox Sports staple now these days. When I was growing up, I always know it was Joe Lenardi, but now today, you are, in my eyes, you're the true rock star. I don't even know Joe's last name no more, man. So, <laughs> so but we, we want to jump right into it. Obviously, this is a Wisconsin podcast, so we want to talk about our Wisconsin Badgers. As everybody knows, been struggling lately, lost nine out of 12. I, I, lost, I lost track, man. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I lost, lost track. more than we won. Yeah. Yeah, lost more than we won lately, but we still love our squad. You had Wisconsin on that six line, five, six line now for about the past month. Right. Uh, I think they, they, I put them at six before anybody else did. They won their way back up. I can't remember. It was just because it's about three weeks ago. They won their way back up uh, temporarily. And then subsequent results have put them down at the six. They, if they did well in Minneapolis, it, I, I think the five is still available because the the fives in particular are really weak uh, as the sixes for the most part are not strong and the edge of the five of the four line isn't great either. I think <laughs> Illinois and Kentucky are pretty solid, but beyond that, not great. So uh, it, there there's room there to move, but the Badgers obviously would have to to resume playing as they did for the first two two to two and a half months of the year. As a as resident Big Ten uh, expert nowadays as well, I think one thing that stands out to me is I think they do have a good chance to move. Just, you know, that matchup, Rutgers and Maryland, I think is a favorable matchup. And then even Northwestern, as good as they are with Boo Booey, I think that's um, – I, I would say Wisconsin would, – would you disagree or agree that Wisconsin has probably more – uh, potential to move up than anybody else. I think they have uh, a decent road to that Purdue game. And then obviously if you beat Purdue, you do tremendous things for, for your chances. Yeah. I mean, they've had two shots at Purdue and they played well in both of them. Mm. Uh, they, a lot of teams that have had a second crack at Purdue actually went, uh, got worse, so to speak. And maybe they didn't get worse. Maybe Purdue got better. It's kind of hard on, but their result got worse. In Wisconsin's case, it didn't. I don't think they were quite as competitive in the second one, but that's understandable. It was at Mackey, the first one at the Cole Center. I thought they played really well in the Cole game and just couldn't. It, it produced just really special. Uh, I, I don't bl blame them a lot for not winning that game. I do wonder why it seemed to have had such a diminishing effect on them because that that wasn't the very beginning of their troubles, but it seemed to really accelerate after that. Uh, and so uh, you wonder why playing so well in that game should have been, hey, look, we just played the best team or second best team in the country, and we were right there, bucket for bucket, till the final two and a half minutes. This should be great for us. And it didn't go that way. And it's disappointing uh, because there were, there were moments when, when this team really had something. And they haven't been able to relocate it. Yeah. Yeah, to your point. I mean, they got to within four in the second half. And I think Caleb first hit a, hit a three from the corner. I think he made like three threes all year. So just one play like that makes a huge difference. But for me, you know, the road struggles have been something that Wisconsin hasn't, you know, I don't think we've won a road game since like mid-January or something. Does that impact our resume in any way just not having that ton of road wins and you mentioned we have room to grow do we also have room to fall if we were to lose in the first round or what does that look like yeah i mean obviously losing in the first round would be not recommended because you're not seeded into a quarterfinal matchup with a fellow ncaa tournament team uh, so that so it's it's hard to afford that and and hold the same seed 
the one thing that Wisconsin has over pretty much everybody else in that grouping, I mean, they're sitting on 12, I think at this stage, still 12 quad one and two wins. It's 11 now, 11 quad one and two wins. One of their, one of their wins slipped out of quad two and into quad three, but it's still uh, more than most teams in that five, six range have. And so they're, that, that's what they're kind of banking on. They played a really difficult schedule. Uh, it's considered to be the second strongest schedule in, in, in college basketball, according to the net. And they've achieved some, some good results against it. Not perfect. Uh, they're 11 and 12 against the first two quadrants. But there are teams that are fighting for uh, seeds like that, uh, that that can't match that, that, that really can't approach that. Uh, you look at someone like at Clemson, which I think is a really solid five, has only 10. And there are teams that uh, that have fewer than that that uh, that would be searching for those kinds that kind of seed. So uh, if you could if you could back up what was already put in the books in the early part of the schedule with a, a solid performance uh, at the target center, then it, it it invigorates what you've already done and allows the committee to say. Hey, okay, they played badly here, or there, but look, look what they did throughout the course of the season. Look what their body of work says. Remember, the fact that they've lost, however many you said, nine out of twelve. That that doesn't. It matters that you lost nine, not that you lost nine out of twelve entering conference mm-hmm. tournament week. It, it, it if you lost that many games, that you know that is on your resume, but. It's been 15 years since the committee eliminated the last 10 portion as a factor. One, fans still think it's in there. I don't know why. It's been 15 years. I mean, it's, I, I've been, we've all been shouting it from the rooftops for 15 years. And two, they think that it should matter, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is that is that data has shown, I started writing about this probably around 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. I can't remember the pinpoint the exact time. The data shows that what you do in the final segment of the season doesn't, it doesn't correlate to what you do in the tournament. You could have a great February and, and, and early March and then go in and lose your first game. You could have a terrible uh stretched run and then you could go in and make the sweet 16 it, it does it, you know like UConn has be great beginning great middle great end Purdue Houston same thing they're going to do great most likely in March but it's the teams that that have a flow and, and sometimes the flow is I'm really bad now and then I get good and then I and then and then I, I'm, I'm really strong at the end and then sometimes those teams do well and sometimes they don't if there's just I used to write that it was the same correlation basically as your uniform color or your team nickname. <laughs> and people are wedded to the idea that if they're coming in hot, they're going to do great. And, and then sometimes those teams do well and, and it's confirmation bias. Sometimes they do badly and they forget about those. Yeah. <laughs> Iowa went out and won the Big Ten tournament in 2022. Uh, Keegan Murray was tearing the cover off the ball. And they went out and they got a bad matchup against Richmond. They didn't. They played a style that was per, the antithetical to typical Iowa under Fran McCaffrey, and they lost. That's sometimes how it goes. That that uh, falls right in. I think my junior year, Josh's freshman year, Kemba Walker's UConn team is probably the the poster child for for you know they were great in the Big East tournament, great in Maui, okay in the middle of the year, and everybody yes. know. And I think I think that's just ingrained in our head. One is athletes for sure. And two, um, as fans, I'm I'm sure as well. But as athletes, it's always oh, you got to peak in March. You got to be playing your best basketball in March. So, yeah, that that that's an interesting uh, take. Real quick for us, for those that might not understand, because there's a lot of misconception around uh, all of the bracketology work you do, as well as the CFP stuff, and it's always a point of contention. Break down kind of what the quad one, quad two, quad three um, sectors are. Yeah, it, it began um, with data, the, the, uh, the computer guys who do uh, college basketball data, Ken Pomeroy, uh, uh, Jeff Sagarin, when he was doing it, he's, he's done doing it now. But people like that who were math uh, analytics uh, gurus uh, pointed out that 
it is harder to win a home game against a, it is harder to win a, excuse me, harder to win a road game against an average ish team than it is to win a home game in many cases against a great team. You're supposed to win at home. And, and the data shows that most teams do, most teams that are competent win the vast majority of their home games. So that's where the quad system came from. So how the quads break down is that any home game against a team ranked in the net rankings, which is a, a predictive metric that was conceived by the NCAA and some of its partners, uh, any any home game against a team ranked 1 to 30 is quadrant 1. Any neutral court game, like in Maui or something like that, is 1 to 50. Uh, it, that is a quad 1 win. And any road game you play against 1 to 75 is a is a quad 1 win. So in in the case of uh, this season, if you won a road game against UNLV, uh, that's considered to be basically the equivalent of winning a home game against Texas Tech. That's 75 and 30. So that shows you the difference. And then it goes down the line through quads two, three, and four. What you do in quad one is obviously the first thing they're going to notice. That's especially germane to teams pursuing the highest spots in the tournament. What you do against quad one is really important if you want to be a one seed, two seed, three seed. As you get further down toward bubble teams, then in order to create some differentiation between uh, teams that are worthy and not, it's often looked at what you do against the first two quadrants combined. Uh, what do you, how, how, how many games did you play? How, how much success did you have? That's often... Uh, the differentiator for a bubble team. And in Wisconsin's case, it's going to be a little bit of a mixture of the two. Most of the teams in that segment, the four, five, six, seven range, are going to have some measure of quad one achievement, but probably not enough to differentiate. And that's where you go into quad two and see what's done. And then they'll also look at what you did against their field. By the time you're getting down to seeding, uh, that you'll already have a full field, and then they'll start to see. So they'll look at Wisconsin and say, okay, well, what did they do against our field? And particularly, they're going to focus on what we call the at-large field, which is basically anybody that would get in the field without an automatic bid. So even though, let's say, Purdue goes out this weekend and wins the Big Ten tournament, um, they'll st- they would still be considered – part of that at-large field. And they're not a great example because we play so late at the Big Ten. Uh, but let's, let's use uh, the uh, Big 12 as an example because they are done early Sunday, Saturday evening. So when they start to seed, and usually that does happen on Saturday, on Sunday morning at some point, uh, they'll, that, they'll know, like, okay, Baylor's your, your uh, Big 12 auto bid, but they'll be part of that grouping. Uh, what did you do against that group, the best teams in the field? And, and in some cases, there might be a team like Apple, well, uh, like Jim, James Madison, for instance, which is, you know, if they win, if they win their conference uh, tournament final, uh, they probably, a win over them would probably carry some weight. But if you're winning against a 16 seed, it's probably not moving the needle very much. Um, yeah, so we talked about, um, obviously, the the metrics of it. You obviously being an expert in that, as well as being an expert in actually watching the games. You've been watching college basketball for for years now. Um, talk about like I don't mean to say that in a. That's <laughs> okay, man. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> Beautiful thing. So I guess talk to us about where you what do you see out of this Wisconsin team? What do you think they can do as far as making a run in the tournament? Well, I I, I like a lot of what they do. There are certain things that they can do that they don't always. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the use of AJ store, uh, it, it goes in and out. And I think that they're more effective when they get him on the move. And sometimes they get, a, they get away from that, but he's really hard to guard off the bounce. And when, when Wisconsin is running its offense, I mean, I'm telling you guys, you know, you, you ran it beautifully, but when Wisconsin's running its offense and it's executing really crisp, crisply, and he gets the ball on the move, I mean, he's usually got space. Uh, and he's an a incredible finisher, and his move to the goal is quicker uh, than than most players can deal with on the defense. We just don't always see enough of that. 
I, I thought that this season really took a, uh, a negative turn when Stephen Crow stopped looking at the goal. Mm. He's constantly looking to what's the next step in this offense that I'm supposed to do. And sometimes, it, it, one, it may be accidental that the opposing team leaves you open. Uh, and, it, and, it, and I thought after a time it was purposeful because he wasn't looking at the goal. So why should I scramble back out to him? If he's not mm -hmm. going to look at it, I'm just going to get to where I know, based on watching reams of film against Wisconsin, where I know the, pro the, the next play is probably going, where the mm -hmm. next screen is going to be set. So I thought that that was a problem, and I don't know that they fully recovered from that. I thought Steven – it started in the Nebraska game, the loss that they had the big lead, yeah. and there was one particular play that set off an alarm for me when Wisconsin was trying to make their comeback and there was still time to throw water on it. And he had the ball on the left wing, uh, and and he was – and, like, no, there wasn't a defender. I don't know if it was rink mask guarding him. I can't remember. But whoever was guarding him got lost, and he was wide open. And he's thinking, okay, Chucky's right here. I got to get the ball to Chucky. That's my next move. And he missed a chance to take that wide open three. I think it wound up a turnover. Uh, and then, and that was, that was, that was a huge moment. And that sort of uh, continued on through a series of games. He's done better uh, recently with that, but I still think there are moments when he, he he's so, some guys are so committed to their team and what the expectation of the team is mm -hmm. that they forget that, a, a, a passed up open shot, a shot that either that the play is either run to create for you or that happens as a result of the action you run. A passed up open shot is essentially a turnover. Mm. And, and you'll find it often turns into a turnover because if you pass up that open shot, that your offense gets gummed up and you wind up with something less than what's possible. And I think I thought that was a significant factor in why Wisconsin has not played as well in the past couple of months as they did early on. Uh, I, I, I think those two factors are probably the most important in why Wisconsin has struggled. Uh, there are others as well, but I, I still believe that this team has the ability to do well. And I think if they can just get themselves right enough in Minneapolis to have a good tournament and they can get a seed that I'm talking about, a five or a six. I I, I think they're hard to play against. You guys know this. They're, Wisconsin's different. Wisconsin mm -hmm. does things differently. And they don't do things differently from year to year so much. So every coach just about in the Big Ten has been through this. It's a lot like Syracuse and the success that they had in the later years when – uh, 2018, they didn't have a great, great team or a great, great season. 2016, they made a Final Four. I think they were 9-9 nine and nine in league that year. Uh, but you went in, and Michigan State, the best example in 2018, is throwing out multiple first-round picks, uh, including Jaron Jackson, who's an NBA star now, and they got up against that zone, and they just couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, they, and, they, and they lost, and it was probably a, a – team that was final four good i mean they made the final four a year later without jaron they made cassius winston and xavier tillman and they didn't make it because they just couldn't find the the, the uh the key to unlock the zone and i think that wisconsin often goes into the tournament and when it when it's feeling good about itself they can do the same things you haven't played us before you don't know how to play us mm -hmm. and if we're doing the things the right way uh, then, then we can beat you, even if you're the better seated team. I, I think uh, I think that hit it right on the head. Josh and I have talked about this both on this podcast and and off. Uh, I think one thing about this team is at the beginning of the year they really were hard to scout for because it's a bit of a different offense than we ran um, when we were at Wisconsin. But it did have a lot of free flow and everybody played freely. So I think to I think you hit it spot on the head as soon as Stephen Crow and guys kind of started making that automatic next move as opposed to taking what's given to you is kind of when and ironically nebraska that second half is really when all the problems started as well so um yeah i, th I think you hit it right on the head with that and i don't know if josh you wanted to add it to yeah i was gonna 
I mean, I think Stephen Crowell, I think four of his last 10 or 11 games, he's had four points or less. And I think that's that just shows – should I be? It's almost like a blessing and a curse that we had five guys who were active, moving, touching it. That you're almost like, well, should I or should I not? And now they're thinking again. And then secondarily, I think a big component of our success was our depth, and that seems to have have went down the drain these past few weeks, where Stephen Crowell and Tyler Wall are getting in foul trouble, and when they get in foul trouble, it seems like we can't quite uh, get the next hump there. And I think against Purdue, that was a big factor. Crowell being in foul trouble, Max Klesman in foul trouble, so. It feels like if we're in March and we get a, a guy or two in foul trouble, we might have a little tough time. But if we get our full team going and playing well, I, I agree, Mike. I don't know uh, how we couldn't make a run or, or shouldn't expect it, it to be at least. And, and Mike, I guess you started the pod by saying the four lines kind of weak, the five lines kind of weak, the three lines kind of weak. Is that <laughs> is that how you feel uh, in college <laughs> basketball in general right now? That there's just a lot of pretty good teams and it's a lot about matchups and who you end up facing and how you're playing at that time. Because that's how I feel. I'm curious from your perspective. I think it's 100 percent true. I don't think it's true with one, two, and three. I I I, I think. UConn is phenomenal, and Purdue is terrific, and then, of course, they have the game-changing player in Zach Eady, and I think Houston is as connected and as, as dynamic and energetic a team as there is. I think they're beatable at the championship level. It's going to take a lot to beat them uh, prior to the Elite Eight, uh, but I, I, I think those three teams have really achieved. Uh, they're tw- I did a thing today uh, where I pointed out there have only been two years in the last decade where the number one seed subset was this strong. Uh, 2015, you guys know all about that. Uh, 2015 was uh, was basically we had five great teams in the country. Uh, I think I thought Villanova was a little bit off the track with you guys, Kentucky, Arizona, and Duke. But Villanova was close. I mean, they went 32 and two. Arizona uh, as well was 36 and three as a two seed. Arizona, I always thought that Arizona should have been the one in the West and you guys should have gone to the, uh, to the East, but it worked out obviously for the Badgers, no complaints for you guys. Uh, but that it's a lot, it's a lot, it's not quite to the level of that year. Cause those, those three teams, uh, those four teams were just phenomenal. Uh, these three though are relative to this season are really extraordinary, but you get past that and you start bumping into all these teams like Kansas that struggle to win Illinois that has, it has a really good team, but a resume that doesn't quite match up to the team. Kentucky, which has gone out there and scored 115 points in seemingly every game, but in more than a few games, given up 120. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of what you're looking at. And those are the better teams the, you, the, the some of the other teams uh, that have, have, populated the four and five line Dayton. I saw Dayton in person in Pittsburgh in early January, and I just didn't think they were great. I think Deron Holmes is terrific, but I didn't think it was a great team. And they've lost, uh, they've lost to just about every really good Atlantic 10 team on the road. Great team, a five seed shouldn't do that. Uh, But I keep looking for somebody to put in that five spot that, that they occupy and I just can't find anybody. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about that lack of achievement. That's uh, But we, we got a couple of minutes. I know before, or Josh, I know you're, you're tight for time. But re- real quick, before we do go, I want to talk about um, just that Wisconsin is still, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, your third highest seeded uh, Big Ten team as yes, of three days ago. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that won't and, change. Uh, and, they could lose the first game in Minneapolis, and that will not change. No one. There's no one that's close enough to pass them. So what is that for that being said, what does that say to you about the state of the Big Ten? And is this the year that we can see, obviously, with the strength of Purdue, is this the year that we see a, a Big Ten championship finally in over 20 years? Yeah, I think I, I think it, Purdue can win it. I don't expect it. I think they have most of the components that you usually need. They probably aren't quite as talented as the typical mm-hmm. champion. That might be okay this year because there aren't very many teams that are. I think Kentucky is, but they just don't defend well enough. I mean, they're not even in the, the uh, arena with what, a de- what, a, what kind of defensive team you usually need to be to win it. Uh, and then certainly Connecticut has everything. Uh, mm-hmm. They've got everything. But they also have the burden of having just done it. That is a challenge. It, that's part of the reason we've only seen – uh, two repeat champions since the UCLA dynasty ended in 
73. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, dy the dynasty didn't, but their back-to-back -back runs did in 73. The dynasty ended in 75. So uh, that that's part of the reason, I think, that carrying that we are the champions burden with you is something. Uh, beyond that, uh, I do think that it comes down to uh, to matchups and how you play. But I still think it's going to have to be somebody. That, these are the categories. You have to have multiple. You have to have at least one draft pick, and it's preferable if you have more more than one first round draft pick. You have to have a top twenty offense and defense. You have to have a point guard like Jordan Taylor who can run the show. <laughs> uh, it, it 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 doesn't hurt if he's a pro, uh, but you have to have somebody that's that that's that kind of player. Uh, you have to have wings who can who can attack the lane. Uh, when it's late clock, and who can also defend and keep guys out of the lane. And that's what I worry about with Houston. That's not really how they're built. They're built with two small guards. And that's why, I, even though they're a great defensive team, I wonder about their offense uh, as a result of that. Uh, and you have to have somebody who can protect the rim. If, if, if I can get to the rim like I can, not me literally, but if I can get to the <laughs> rim against Duke uh, the way I could against Duke, uh, that's a problem. Duke Duke really struggles at the rim. Their defense has gotten better, but they don't have rim protection. And I don't remember a team that yep. uh, I've done the research on all these categories. And it's pretty much universal that everybody that wins is, is fairly solid in those categories. And, you, I mean, that, that I mentioned that first round pick. I, there are lots of times I see uh, – brackets projected publicly sometimes by people in the game sometimes by sports journalists or sports commentators that are famous but maybe not famous for college hoops and I'll see them circle a team that doesn't have any pros on it or any first round picks and I'm like you're out already it's mm -hmm. it's day one and you're already done because <laughs> it's 19 it's been since 1987 that no team has won the national championship without a first round pick in its rotation that's a long period of time. That's basically my entire career covering college hoops. Uh, mm. and, and so it, I can tell you that's a long time. Well, I would I would actually contend that, you know, Wisconsin, not from a numerical standpoint, but from all the other things you mentioned on court, my, I think we have a lot of those things that you mentioned. I don't know if we have a first-round pick maybe this year. AJ Storr is someone who you never know. but It doesn't um, have to be necessarily in that year. In that year. Like, like, cause Villanova, when they did it in 16, there, those of us who know this, you know, that stat or whatever, we're looking at each other on press row and saying, did they just break the mold? But then, <laughs> uh, you know, a couple of years later or okay, the following year, Josh Hart is picked first yeah. round, Mikhail Bridges a couple of years after that. Uh, so it, they, they had th those guys and those guys were game changers when they needed to be. Yep. 100%. And Jalen Brunson, by the way, should have been a first-round pick. That's 30, one the NBA dropped the ball on, obviously. Yeah, 30, 31-32 is a first-round pick in in our eyes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and, and I think he's done, as you mentioned, done more than back that up. But yeah. that is uh, that, is, that is all we got for you. We appreciate you. Before we go, but just to reiterate, Mike DeCourcy has Wisconsin at the sixth line facing New Mexico as of three days ago in the Midwest round. And, Mike, if you wanted any constructive feedback, Mike Went is underneath in the comments saying, why is Wisconsin a six seed? They suck ass. So if <laughs> <laughs> well mike just so, told us that all the other fives and six <laughs> too, so just yeah <laughs> so so mike went hopefully wisconsin comes out and proves you wrong and uh we'll see what happens it comes tournament time but mike the Corsi, we appreciate you jumping on with us uh we have to make it a yearly thing now um like i said greatly appreciate your time we know you're a busy man the superstar of march and first shot of whiskey podcast i'm jordan taylor josh gasser and we'll catch you next time